So I'm going to be preaching from the book of Hosea, just a little introduction. We're not going to go through the whole book. Uh, a little introduction of the book of the prophet Hosea. So chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 2. Hosea is the book right after Daniel, or you can look at the, the screen. I'm, I'm going to start using the uh, NASB as well. So God's Word says in Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, the word of the Lord which came to Hosea, the son of Beeri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take your, to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the, son, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Loruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I would ever forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. And when she had weaned Loruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Loami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up from the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you for this day. I pray you bless your word to your people and bless the message in spite of the messenger for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. So as I said, there's so much in the Old Testament that connects, that builds the foundation for the, the truths in the New Testament. And it's because the same God who revealed the epistles and gospels of the New Testament revealed the histories and the prophecies in the Old Testament to those prophets and writers in the Old Testament and gave us this amazing book that tells one coherent story from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And it really is amazing to think that this one story was written over 2,000 years. And we're going we're gonna to come right dead in the middle of that to Hosea, um, which was written about 3,000 years ago, about 700 before, years before the birth of, of Christ. And, and then today we're just going to look at the first chapter, which gives us an introduction to the book. And, and, and it's really written in a great way. This first chapter encapsulates the whole book. So it gives us kind of an outline of, of everything in the book and, and give it, so we can, we can study this and get the gist, the idea of the rest of the book of, of Hosea. So Hosea was a prophet of God and, and he mainly spoke to what was called the northern kingdom of Israel. And sometimes you'll read in the, the Bible, it's called Samaria or Ephraim. And, uh, that'll, that'll be uh, important later. But, uh, verse one tells us the time frame for when he prophesied. He said, the word of the Lord, which came to Hosea, the son of Beeri during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And so I would really commend uh, you and, and your normal Bible reading to go ahead and open up the Old Testament and read the, the books of Samuel and the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles, and you will get a, a history of what's happening. And so in those books, uh, through through a lot of those, uh, this king did this, and then he died and his son and all that stuff, uh, Hosea saw several of those kings in his life come and go, and some did better and some did worse. And, and he was called by God to prophesy to those kings, the, the word of God to those. And in, in the book of Kings and, and the book of Chronicles, you'll see that, that King David was called as king, and then his son Solomon came and, and built a temple. 
And then after Solomon came, there was Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was not wise. And so God split the kingdom. Rehoboam took the south, which was called the kingdom of Judah, and Jeroboam took the north, which was called the kingdom of Israel. And in the very beginning of its existence, the northern kingdom would stray farther from God than the southern kingdom, and it would, would stray faster than the southern kingdom would. And so Jeroboam set up two calves in, uh, golden calves in, in Dan, uh, to, for the, the, the northern kingdom to worship to, worship, so they wouldn't have to go to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem to go to the temple. He said in 1 Kings 12, 28, after he consulted and made the calves, he said to them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt, speaking of the golden calves um, that he had built. And this, these golden calves would be a stumbling block to him and to all the kings who came after them. And so because of this, it was easier for the, the people of the, the kingdom of Israel to turn their eyes away from God and from the, the worship that he had, had set up. And they began to worship more idols. They would take the, the false gods of the lands around them and begin to, to worship them. They would worship Baal or Baal. And uh, they would worship Asherah, the queen of heaven. And then they would worship a god called Molech, who was worshipped by putting their baby boys and girls into the outstretched brass hands of this god, which a fire and a furnace was built in the inside, burning their children alive to worship this false god. And in all this, God would send prophets. He sent Elijah, he sent Elisha, he sent Isaiah and Hosea and many more to preach the, the judgment uh, to them. There was many prophets they had, which we don't have books written from the prophets. But no matter how many times he would send the prophets, uh, they were unrepentant. They never turned completely away from worshiping false gods. And even the, the best kings who would tear down the idols and, and get rid of what's called the high places never got rid of the two golden calves that's called Jeroboam's sin. So God in, in this time calls Hosea, and, and we're going to see that he uses Hosea's very life itself to illustrate God's judgment on their sin. He also uses his life to illustrate his salvation to them and to us 3,000 years later. So the first part of what I want to see, I want y'all to see, is he uses Hosea's very life to show us his judgment illustrated with Hosea's marriage. Look at verse number 2. It says, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry. For the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. So if we look at the the church in America today, we see many confused people. We see confused people in the pews and in the pulpits and there's a, a trend, especially in our time, if you look on Facebook, you'll see advertisements for uh, bishop so-and-so is having a, a meeting or, or apostle so-and-so or prophet or prophetess is having a, a healing meeting or, or whatever. And they're going to speak a word of the Lord to you. Um, but they're, they're you're using those titles because they sound bibbly. They sound bibbly, you know, uh, and, and makes them feel and look important. But to be a prophet or a prophetess in the Old Testament was a special calling uh, that that God gave to uh, a person. And uh, it wasn't necessarily something that you would want to be called yourself because you knew what was coming. People didn't love the prophets that told the truth. They, they didn't respect them. It wasn't something that they, you know, you've uh, reached prophetness and uh, then you get all this uh, uh, good, good accolades on yourself. Because the prophets had bad news that they would give the people. There was a king in in the northern kingdom, Israel, named Ahab. And you may not recognize his name, but you recognize his his wife, Queen Jezebel. Uh, He was not a a, a righteous king. And so one day uh, there was a nation that was was battling with them called Aram. And and many times they battled with the Arameans. 
And uh, so he called uh, the king Jehoshaphat from the southern kingdom of Judah. And he said, look, we'll, we'll join together and we'll go fight these Arameans and, and uh, we'll, we'll take care of them. So Je- Jehoshaphat said, OK, well, let's let's make a treaty. We'll get together. But first, let's get the prophets together and see what, what Yahweh is going to say, if he's going to bless our fighting or not. And so he, Ahab got 400 prophets together and they're all dancing around in front of him and they got bullhorns and they're saying all this stuff and, and that God's gonna, gonna gore the Arameans like, like these bullhorns and stuff like that. And, and Jehoshaphat said, wait a second. These are a bunch of ear ticklers. This ain't, they're not acting right. Something's wrong. And so he said, and, and, uh, he asked Ahab if, if there's any other prophets of Yahweh that they can call. Well, Ahab said in 1 Kings 22, 8, he said, The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Micaiah, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And this was true. Micaiah did not have good news. He said, Look, God's going to use this to get rid of you, Ahab, and, and to hurt you. And uh, so... It, King Ahab put him in prison and said, feed him sparingly until I get back from war. So it was difficult to be a prophet of God. They, no one wanted to hear what you had to say. And then on top of that, God would use you as a personal illustration, as a physical illustration of the judgment that he would bring. So, you know, prophet Ezekiel, we're going to go through a little passage here. It's going to be interesting, maybe a little PG-13, but uh uh so God used Ezekiel's person literally to illustrate the judgment of God in, in many ways. Ezekiel 4, 1 says, Now you, son of man, get yourself a brick, place it before you, and inscribe a city on it, Jerusalem. Then lay siege against it, and build a siege wall, raise up a ramp, pitch camps, and place battering rams against it all around. Then get yourself an iron plate and set it up as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face toward it so that it is under siege and besiege it. This is a sign to the house of Israel. Okay, so the picture is he gets a brick and he writes Jerusalem on it and then he makes these little miniature toys of siege works, little battering rams and catapults and stuff, and he places it around the brick. And then he gets an iron plate to look up uh, to make a wall. And then he's supposed to, to siege to play siege around this brick to show uh, Israel what's going to happen. And he says, as for you, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the numbers of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity, 390 days. Thus you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So he was to lay on his side and point and say, hey, y'all are going to be under siege for this many years. And he had to sit there for 390 days and do that. But that wasn't all. When you have completed these, you shall lie on the second time, but on your right side and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. I have assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. Then you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem when you're, with your arm bared and prophesy against it. Now behold, I will put ropes on you so you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have completed the days of your siege. Can you imagine being a prophet of God? Ezekiel having to sit there for 450 days and point on either side covered in ropes as an illustration to what God was going to do. And that wasn't even the worst part of it. We're about to get to the worst part. He told him what he could eat. Uh when he was pretending to be under siege. At first, it doesn't sound so bad. Verse 9 of chapter 4 of Ezekiel. But as for you, take wheat and barley, beans, lentils, millet, and spelt. Put them in one vessel and make them into bread for yourself. You shall eat it according to the number of the days that you lie on your side, 390 days. Your food which you shall eat shall be 20 shekels a day by weight. You shall eat it from time to time. The water you shall you drink shall be the sixth part of a hen. By measure, you shall drink it from time to time. He wanted to illustrate that there was going to be a famine. There was going to be food was going to be scarce. So you could only eat this little bit of bread and drink this little bit of water. You shall eat it as a barley cake, having baked it in their sight over human dung. Then the, the, uh, then the Lord said, Thus will the sons of Israel eat their bread unclean among the nations where I will banish them. But then Ezekiel said, Ah, Lord God, 
Behold, I have never been defiled from my youth until now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beast, nor has any unclean meat ever entered my mouth. And then he has mercy and he says, okay, see, I will give you cow's dung in place of human dung over what you will prepare your bread. So if these charlatans today that you see on Facebook knew what it meant to be a prophet of God, to go live in the wilderness and and eat locusts and honey, to eat meals for 450 days cooked over cow dung because God was merciful and didn't make you do it over human dung, do you think they'd want to be a prophet or a prophetess? No, it's not easy. And they had bad news to give. And so it was with Hosea. He wasn't called to do what Ezekiel was called to do to illustrate God's coming judgment but he was called to, to, to use his own life as an illustration for what God was going to do in judgment to the northern kingdom. He was called to, verse 2, take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. He was to marry someone who would be unfaithful, someone who would be adulterous and represent what the Jews, what the Israelites were doing to their their God who who loved them. God considered the Jewish people to be His bride. Isaiah 54.5 says, For your husband is your Maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. And Lord, that's, that's what we're looked at today. And, and, and a couple of weeks ago, when Philip was talking in John 5, he made that very clear that, that God's church, uh, the, the church is Christ's bride and he is our bridegroom coming back. And in two or, or three years, when we get to Ephesians 5, uh, that'll be made very clear as Paul uses this idea of the church being Christ's bride to teach us how to treat each, treat each other as wives and as husbands. Ephesians 5.22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And then the last verse, verse 32, says, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So God created our marriages here to be a picture of the intimacy and the love that Christ has for His church, for us, His people. And so when the Israelites and when we go and worship other gods, when we uh, uh, have false gods, then we forget about the covenant that we made. When the Israelites forget about the covenant that they made with God as a wife, it was just like Gomer, Hosea's adulterous, uh, uh, prostituting wife. And that was the illustration that God used in Hosea's life to show the people what they were like. And then it goes a little farther. He uses his marriage as an illustration of judgment. And then he even uses his children and their names as illustrations of his judgment. Verse 4 through 9, And the Lord said to him, Name him Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Name her Loruhama, for I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I would ever forgive them. But I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God and will not deliver them by bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. When she had weaned Loruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Loami, for you are not my people and I am not your God. And so if his marriage wasn't enough of an illustration, now his three children get to take part in his personal illustration of God's judgment. Hosea has two boys and a girl. And God instructs him to, to name them specifically so that every time their name is spoken, they will be reminded of an aspect of the judgment of God. 
His first son was named Jezreel. It says in verse 4, For yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Jezreel was a, a valley where God had, had a man named Jehu fight against King Ahab of Israel. And the, the reason that, that Jezreel was a great place for battle was because it was a, a flat valley, so your chariots and your cavalry would have room to maneuver in the battle. And so God had commanded Jehu to take the throne away from Ahab and his sons. He said in 2 Kings 9, 5, when he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting. And he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And Jehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, O captain. He arose and went into the house and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord, even on over Israel. You shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel. And none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. So he, he is anointed to be the next king of Israel. And in order to do this, he is called to, to kill, um, uh, King Ahab in, in battle. And that happens. And so he becomes king. And when he becomes king, he, he tricks the worshipers of Baal, all these idol worshipers. And, uh, he gets them together. Second Kings 10, 18. It says, then Jehu gathered all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little. Jehu will serve him much. And so they're all excited and they get all together and he, he gathers them up into this big circle and then he slaughters them all with a sword. So he, he begins to take back worship for Yahweh. He, he tore down and burnt the idols. It says in, in 2 Kings 10, 27, they also broke down the sacred pillar of Baal and broke down the house of Baal and made it a latrine to this day. So the, the, it starts off good with old Jehu there. But there was a couple of problems with what he did. He didn't go all the way with what God had commanded him. Outwardly, it looked like he was doing good, but he, he didn't do it all the way. Second Kings 10, 29. However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, which he made Israel sin, from these Jehu did not depart, even the golden calves that were at Bethel and that were at Dan. He left those golden calves up that the, the, the Israelites would go and worship instead of at the temple in Jerusalem. He still wasn't faithful. He still acted like an adulterous wife. So God uses Hosea's firstborn son. He named him Jezreel to remind them of why they were going to be judged. And then they have a, a daughter, and they name her Loruhama. The name Loruhama means no pity. No compassion, no mercy. Verse six of chapter one. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Loruhama, for I will ha- no longer have compassion on the house of Israel that I would ever forgive them. The whole succession of leadership of Israel was marked by sin and idolatry, but God was merciful. He protected them many times in battle. He gave them success. He sent them prophets to tell them His will and His word, but they they still turned away and followed after idols. They disregarded God completely at times, and others, like Jehu, just paid lip service to what He told them to do. So 2 Kings 17 tells of the last king of Israel and how they became conquered by Assyria. 2 Kings 17.1, In the twelfth year of King Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned nine years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, only not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his servant and paid him tribute. For the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hoshea and 
who had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and had offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. So the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and carried Israel away into exile and settled them in Hala and Habor on the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. There was no mercy, no pity, no compassion on Israel when God sent the Assyrian king to judge them and take them into exile. Judah was not so. The southern kingdom, God would have compassion on them. And he said that in verse number seven, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah and that he would deliver them by bow, sword, battle, or without, he would deliver them himself without bow, sword, battle, or horses or horsemen. Now, I want you to picture this, especially those of you that have children. That God calls you to name your daughter no mercy, no pity, no compassion. Hey, no compassion, come here. Every single time you'd call her, you'd be reminded of the judgment of God. Every special occasion, every birthday, every, every holiday, every feast, uh, you would be reminded that God was going to have no pity no mercy on uh, Israel, the northern kingdom. And then they have an- another son, and the same thing. God uses his name to pronounce judgment. He calls him Loami, which means not a people. He, Hosea verses uh, 8 and 9, When she had weaned Loruhama, no mercy, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Loami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Again, imagine every instance of calling your son's name. Not my people. Come here. Not, I'm not going to be your God. Come, come, come see. It was a, a built-in progression to these names. Jezreel showing why they would be judged. Uh, Lo Ruhama showing in the method and how they would be judged with no mercy and no compassion. And then Lo Ami showing what the judgment was going to be. They were not going to be the people of God. God was preaching a three-point sermon through the names of Hosea's children. So when it comes to not being the people of God, if you remember from the New Testament, this was the, the pride and joy of the Pharisees. What do you mean? We need you. We're the Jews. We're the people of God. We're Abraham's children. And it, and it comes from Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This was the reason that they existed at all. But by the way, remember when Jeroboam set up the calves, he said, behold, these calves, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They've already said, you're not my God. We're not your people to Yahweh. But God, as is, as taking them as their people, he, he called them out of nothing. They were no people at all. And he called Abraham out of the Ur of Chaldees, a, a pagan uh, idol worshiper, not because Abraham was a good man, but for God's own purposes and his own, as we saw in Sunday school. And he watched over them for centuries. He directed them with his word and with his prophets. He loved them and he rescued them from their enemies. He was long suffering when they sinned and they sinned a lot. He provided for their needs. He even brought water from the rocks when they were thirsty. And he revealed himself to them in his word. They were special to him. They were his people. But even though they were his people from that point in, in, Exodus, 6, in Exodus 6, when Moses repeated the, the words of God to them, their whole history was one of sin and rebellion. Every step of the way in the wilderness, they complained and grumbled and didn't believe and turned away from God. And now it has gotten so bad that they even take their, their babies and, and burn them for a false god and an idol, and passing their children through the fire. 
God had designed them to be a shining jewel to the world of who God is and what He has done for His people. But they turned their backs on them. They squandered it and, and, and went to dumb and blind and deaf pieces of rock and wood and gold. God would judge them, and when they was done judging them, there would be no nation. Look at 2 Kings 17.7. Now this came about because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them up from the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel and in the customs of the kings of Israel which they had introduced. The sons of Israel did things secretly which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns from from watchtower to fortified city. They set for themselves uh, sacred pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places as the nations did which the Lord had carried away to exile before them. And they did evil things provoking the Lord. They served idols concerning which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen but stiffened their neck like their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected His statutes and His covenant which He made with their fathers and His warnings with which He warned them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God and made for themselves molten images, even two calves, and made an Asherah and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire and practice divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking Him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from His sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. God would have them devastated by the Assyrians, taken into exile, away from their land, and then they would be replaced by what was later known as the Samaritans. But that wouldn't be the end. There's one more part to God's three-point sermon. He didn't leave them without hope. He used His marriage to illustrate His judgment. He used the names of His kids to illustrate His judgment. But then He shows His salvation through what's going to happen in the future. Verse number 10, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together and they will appoint for themselves one leader and they will go up from the land for great will be the day of Jezreel. Say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Here in the last part of our passage, in the, in the first chapter, God shows that there is hope even after His judgment. He is not just using Hosea to preach the bad news of coming judgment, but the hope of salvation that He is providing. And this is the, the theme of the book. If you go through the rest of His proclamations in the book of Hosea, He, he shows them that, hey, you're sinning. Hey, God's going to judge you. But hey, God's making a promise of salvation come afterwards over and over again. And this is how God works. God is a holy God and He has holy wrath, but also to the same degree of perfection, His wrath that we learned about this morning in Sunday school and His hatred, He loves, He shows grace, He shows mercy, and He shows it through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here in this passage. God made a promise to Abraham that his seed would be as the, the number of the sands of the sea. The, they would grow and grow, and that would be his people. And so God here is telling them, hey, God is still faithful. God is going to remember his promise to Abraham, and he's going to bring you back. And not only that, he's going to put the kingdoms back together. And they're going to follow one leader, a son of David, and his name we know is Jesus Christ. Verse 10 shows how this great reversal happens. Only God could do this. Yet the number of sons 
of Israel will be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. His judgment would surely come to pass. But He was going to use this situation for His glory and to work His will of good and His will of love and grace and mercy for His people. And this is the first time that phrase, the sons of the living God, that idea it comes to place. And Christ would use this phrase, quoting this prophecy throughout his uh, the Gospels. And Paul in Romans 9 would take this idea of us being the sons of the living God and show that this was not just a prophecy for the Jews and the Hebrews, but he was going to use this to expand the kingdom even to us, the Gentiles. Look at Romans 9, 23. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, that's us, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. So when he talks about reuniting those two kingdoms of Israel and Judah with one leader, a king from the line of David, he's talking about Jesus Christ and the kingdom that we will be a part of in the future. He is talking about the full and final salvation of Jesus Christ, even to those who don't deserve it, who have been unfaithful to him in the past. He's going to call them back in salvation and grace and mercy. So look at the, he, he uses the names of, of those children to show his judgment, and he's going to use those same names to show the reversal of the judgment. Jezreel, the word Jezreel, the valley, means God sows. And so where it first meant God sows destruction for the Jews, his people, it now means that God sows a people. Look at verse 11. The sons of Judah, the sons of Israel will be gathered together, and they will appoint for themselves one leader, and they will go up from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel, God's sowing. And look, that part where it says, if it's still on the screen, and they will go up, that could be translated, they will spring up, like a, a plant springs up from the ground when it sprouts. Great will be the day of God's sowing of a people. And then the, whoever put the chapter divisions kind of messed up here. Verse 1 should be in, in the same passage. It says, say to your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. And with a stroke of the pen, he cuts off that lo, which means no or not, and changes lo Ami, not a people, to Ami, a people, his people. Lo Ruhamah, which means no mercy, becomes Ruhamah, mercy and grace and compassion and pity. So he uses his names, the children, his name of his children again to show his mercy and his grace, his compassion, that we will be his people again and that he will sow us and will spring up out of the ground in glory, in his glory, and that he will have mercy on us. Praise God. And so through the, the 14 chapters of the book of Hosea, this is the pattern. He, he shows their sin, he shows his judgment, and then he shows his mercy. In chapter three of Hosea, Gomer, his, his adulterous wife, uh, will go back into a life of adultery. And God says, Hey, take her back. This is what they're doing. They have left me and I will take them back. And this shows his mercy on us even as Christians. God's people will be his bride for all of eternity. We are all gomers. That is who we are. He has saved us out of a life of, of sin. And we're constantly tempted to return, just like Gomer did. But he is gracious and merciful. We are now Ami. He is now uh, Ruhama on us, mercy on us. And we look around at our world and we, we're talking about persecution this morning and, and our freedom and, 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 you know, 13, at least 13 people, Christians a day are killed around the world for their faith. And that waxes and wanes throughout all of our lives. And God is showing his judgment to the world as they turn their back on his truth and his gospel. And through this time, 
We remember because of His great salvation that He has called us to be His bride. His church is His bride. And, and, and one day, and one time, we will be with Him forever in eternity, a married church of God, Christ's bride forever. Revelation 19.6 Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. Brothers and sisters, we are the bride of Christ. And no matter what happens in this life, as many, how many times we're pulled away from the faith and become unfaithful, God is faithful to keep us, to call us back in mercy, to be His people. And one day we'll be in His presence, His people forever. In the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will enjoy that truth and His salvation forever, no matter what has happened here. And this is the message we bring. We bring a message of judgment like Hosea. We know the problems of the world. We know the sin of the people around us. We call them to, we call them to the judgment of God and say, Hey, God is coming. He is a holy and just God and his wrath will be poured out on all who sin against him. But we also say, Hey, there is grace and mercy to everyone who turns from their sin and faces Christ and who's opening his arms in mercy and grace to make them his people too. And that is where we are at today. So we look forward to this time and we know now where we're at so we can and, and learn and praise God, not only that we would deserve judgment, that he will be faithful and just in his wrath and his holy justice to bring judgment to all who deserve it, except those who he has given salvation and grace and mercy for. Praise the Lord for the message of Hosea. I hope that opens your eyes to some of the truths. And as you read the New Testament, he's quoted often. Uh, God, God bless you and, and thank you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for your message of mercy and grace in the book of Hosea. I pray that, that you'd bless your word to our ears and may we go out and preach the, the, like, like Hosea did to those around us for your glory and your honor alone. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.